Well, greetings and welcome to Dr. Leo Hetfield Online. If you're a partner of our church or whether you just stumbled upon this video, I really would just want to welcome you and say that I trust that in today's message you would experience something of the life and the truth of Jesus. As you can hear, it is pouring outside, so we're going to enjoy the rain in the background. But I want to invite you to open up a Bible with me, whether it's on your phone or the good old paper version, and you can open it to the book of Acts in the New Testament. Acts 10 verse 34 is where we're going to pick up the story today. And if you're kind of new to our church, you wouldn't know that we've been preaching through the book of Acts for the last couple of months. And in this section of the book, we're doing a series that we're calling Those Jesus People. Why? Because next week when we finish off our series, we're finally getting to this verse where for the first time in history, the Jesus movement was identified by the people in the city called Antioch as Christians, Christians. Jesus people. Why? Because they were not known for their politics or their opposition to gay people or science or something like that. But they were a Jesus-obsessed, Jesus-saturated people. And that's what we're saying our country and our city of Tswane needs. is a people known for our devotion and our love for and our passion for Jesus. And we've been looking at them as a people of reconciliation, a people of good news, a people of service, and a people of hope. But today we want to see that they were a people of salvation. And I want to invoke, if you're a Christian today, just the words of David and just speak it over you. That as we go into the Bible, that you would experience, famously Psalm 51, 12, saying, God, restore the joy of my salvation to me. May the joy of what you have done in my life through Jesus become this, this fountainhead of joy and purpose and hope in my life. And if you're not a Christian, maybe today you can peer into something of the sweetness of what that means for every person who cries out in the name of Jesus. So last week we left the story where for the first time, the good news of Jesus crossed over into the non-Jewish world, this big revelation. And now we're picking up in verse 34. It says, Peter began to speak. Now I truly understand that God doesn't show favoritism, but in every nation, the person who fears him and who does what is right is acceptable to him. He sent the message to the Israelites, proclaiming the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, that he is the Lord of all. You know the events that took place throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John preached. And this is what it was, verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who are under the tyranny of the devil, because God was with him. And we ourselves are witnesses of everything he did, both in the Judean country and in Jerusalem. And yet they killed him by hanging him on a tree. But God raised up this man, and on the third day caused him to be seen, not by all people, but by us, whom God appointed as witnesses, who ate and drank with him, and he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to judge the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that it's through his name that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. And while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came down on all of those who heard the message. The circumcised believers, the Jewish and other words believers who had come with Peter, they were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people, for they had heard them speaking in tongues and declaring the greatness of God. Then Peter responded, can anyone withhold water and prevent these people from being baptized? who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. And so he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And then they asked them to stay for a few days. Such a powerful scripture. And I think this is such a crucial moment in the history of the church. But I think if you read with me, I'm sure that this also stood out to you, that the main theme for me in this passage is found in that very first verse. When Peter says, what? Now I truly understand salvation, the good news. And this is so striking, guys, because Peter 
was the one, one of them who walked with Jesus for three years, who saw him do countless miracles and healings, who himself saw Jesus resurrected. He was present at his crucifixion and he saw him alive again. He saw so many things happening. He himself saw people coming to faith in Jesus. And yet here he says, now I truly understand. What does that mean? You know, in the world of, of diamond valuation, there are usually four C's that people look at. And two of them are the clarity and the cut of the diamond. In other words, the brilliance of the diamond as you look at it from all these angles. What was happening to Peter here is even though he had seen all of these things all throughout his life, as he turned the brilliant diamond of salvation in Jesus, he was struck once again by realities, angles that he had never seen before, never understood before, and it brought him to a place of awe and worship before God. That is what salvation is meant to be. That all these different inexhaustible angles of the brilliant diamond of what Jesus has done for us, what God has done in Jesus for the world, as we turn the diamond, we say, yes, it is the fact that we have been reconciled in relationship with the Father. Yes, it is the fact that my sin, past, present, and future has been completely washed. It is the truth that I now receive the spirit presence of God in my heart. It is the truth that God adopts me as his son or daughter. It is the truth as I keep on turning that now he has restored my identity, my worth, my calling in him, my true design. All of these things and countless more are like this diamond that we continually turn to. And here's the thing, the true, I want to say the true source of joy and identity of power, of boldness, of resilience in the Christian faith is found by daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, decade in and decade out, having these moments and seasons where I turn the brilliant diamond of salvation and I once again come to the fact of what God has done for me and I say now even more than in the past, after one year of serving Jesus, 10, 20, 50 years of being Christian, I truly understand even more of what Jesus has done for me. We can't go through all of them, but we see Peter having a couple of these almost sides of the diamond just shine into his heart. Verse 36 or 34 to 36, you can read with me there. But for instance, he sees that it's for all people. He realizes that every single person in your home, in your office, colleague, family member, friend, neighbor, every person has this, this deep sense of lostness and emptiness that they try and fill with sex and status and career and money, but it doesn't work. Every person is calling out to be known in the depth of their soul, whatever they call it with their words, it's God that they are looking for. Peter realizes it's for all people, but he also realizes it's for every nation of people. The Greek word ethnos, ethnicity. He realizes, and what we're saying as Dr. Hatfield is we want to be in Pretoria, a multi-ethnic church, because if the reality of the new heavens and new earth will be, you know, a multitude of all the nations, of all ethnic groups around the throne, living together in harmony, why not have that here on earth? He says it's for all peoples, but he also realizes it says there it's through the name of Jesus. It's not general religion. It's not just trying to be a good person. It's not taking a little bit of, of Hinduism and Judaism and, you know, maybe Islam and putting it all together or it's a new age thinking. No, he says it's the name of Jesus that brings salvation. And the more that Peter looks at it, he's struck again by what has happened. The true source of daily, weekly, yearly, decade in, decade out, joy and strength and boldness and resilience in the Christian faith is regularly through the word and spirit of people of God coming to the place where you turn the brilliant diamond of salvation and you are brought back to a place of joy, of humility, of strength, of hope. Now, why is this so important? Because if that does not happen, this continual moment of now I understand even more, 
These are some of the things. I think there are a hundred, but let me give you five things that can happen. The first is this, religious burnout. You see, when I am now suddenly no longer living from the place of acceptance and forgiveness in Jesus, but I start living for acceptance and forgiveness in Jesus, I burn out. Why? Because now suddenly I'm serving in the church. I'm trying to keep my cool at work. I'm forcing myself to read and, and to pray. And I'm, I'm going to community group and I'm giving financially and I'm trying my best to forgive people. But I'm doing all these things with gritted teeth because I'm trying to, to carry the favor of God to make him happy, but he's never happy, it feels like. And I'm never at peace. I'm on this treadmill called religion and I'm burning out. It always happens. I have a friend who's a brilliant drummer, but many years ago, he was in our church, and at one stage, he left the church. He left the faith. For more than two years, he identified as an atheist, and he was angry at all of these kind of spiritual things. Eventually, through just an amazing story, God brought him back into the place of fellowship. But he would say that one of the issues was that he had gotten so caught up in trying to do for God instead of living from the salvation he received in God, I can burn out on religion. If I don't turn the diamond regularly, what can happen is the infatuation will come to an end. Guys, let's be honest. If Whether you're a guy or a girl, if you're in love with someone, if you're infatuated with them, man, that's a sweet emotion. Because you float around in the house and at work and your mind is just occupied with this person. It's beautiful. But even physiologically, that can't go on for more than two years. Those emotions have to be replaced and superseded by deeper emotions of commitment and loving devotion. You know, it's great to feel in love, but you can't have a 40-year love devotion that's built on feelings of infatuation. And you know what? Faith is exactly the same. I see it so often with young people who become Christian and two years in, it's just beautiful. It's the Bible, it's the church and revelation and God is good and he's doing all these things. And then just a couple of things and the road just trips me up and suddenly I'm down in the dumps and it feels like the emotions have gone. Yes, the infatuation has gone. Now I need to develop a mature and a deeper faith that is constantly being reinvented by looking at all the facets of what God has done for me. You know, I've worked with students almost my whole life as a pastor, and I've sat in so many conversations where, where early 20-year-olds are rollercoastering through their faith because they are going from the in-the-moment feeling to in-the-moment feeling. Instead of saying, God, will you come and reveal greater depth in my heart of what you have done through Jesus, a people of salvation. Thirdly, is feelings of pride and superiority toward others will take root to my heart. You see, the thing is, if I don't regularly revisit what God has done in salvation in my heart, then instead of that constant place of humility and gratitude that grows in my heart, it will be replaced by a sense of superiority that I have over others that don't have the revelation I have. Even other people groups that I start to see as inferior. I'll start seeing people in the church who are struggling as weak because I make good decisions and I live a moral life. I will have a proud and superior heart if I'm not constantly brought back to the beauty and the awestruckness of the fact that God has saved me. Fourthly, is that my security and my joy and my faith, they will not be based on the finished work of salvation in Jesus, but on my circumstances, on my emotions. You see, I begin feeling eventually that God kind of owes me actually a good life. He owes me a well-paying job. He owes me the ability to have kids. He owes me to, to live in a country that's safe. He owes me these things. Actually, one of our good friends, their worship leader at one stage in their church who had served there for many years very faithfully, they were not able to have kids. And one day he posted this venomous post on Facebook to say after the last couple of months, they've realized that this whole God thing is just nonsense because there are people in South Africa throwing their babies into trash cans and here we are serving God, working for Him and look at what happens. Man, like my heart bleeds for that couple. 
But the truth is that is replacing the beauty of salvation with I want the circumstances of my life to be a certain way. The fifth thing and final thing can be the fact that I no longer see myself as a city changer. If I don't have a deep understanding, a growing understanding of salvation, I will simply see it as I'm saved and I'm going to heaven. That's it. That's the whole picture for me. And therefore, I really have nothing to do. I'm just kind of doing secular things like going to work and parenting and whatnot. And I'm just waiting to die and going to heaven. But that is not the fullness of the diamond. The more I see that it affects every part of my life, that I am a kingdom agent called to bring the kingdom to earth in my parenting and my work to be a representative of God, to be his ambassador. I'm a walking, talking embassy in the city, seeking out the lost, healing the pain, restoring what's broken. It's only when I have a deep understanding of salvation. You are going to get so bored with Sunday celebrations and community groups if I am not living an adventurous Christian faith in between. That is why it's needed. The key to lifelong joy and power and boldness and resilience in my Christian faith, even with the up and downs, is I need to have a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, decade in, decade out habit of seeing the diamond of my salvation turned and new angles and, and it just reflects into my heart in joy. Why is that so important? You know, part of our modern life is that we are bombarded with so much info, so much news. In fact, Dr. Martin Hilbert, he's at the University of Southern California. He says that studies have shown that the average, you know, modern person like you and me, we are confronted, we are bombarded with more than 174 newspapers worth of info every single day. Can you imagine that? All that news, all these things shouting at you, all this info trying to, to shake you and turn you and transform you. But the reality is we all know that not all news is created equal. Some news is astounding, it's shocking, it changes you, it's beautiful. Some news, it's just meh, just like meh, not much. In fact, I, I found three on the internet meh news articles. This is true. The first one is woman finds a hat in a tree. Shocking stuff. <laughs> Woman finds a hat in a tree. That's it. That's the whole thing. Second one, crime report. Oh my goodness, what happened? A 19-year-old arrested for vandalizing a McDonald's. What did he do? He ripped up some paper and threw it on the ground. Guys, I was thinking, come to South Africa. We will show you how to rip up some things. Or how about this third one? Weekend newspaper have got this big story. A kitten has been found that looks like Hitler. Okay, well, let's be honest. That last one I do actually want to see. Like, that is truly gripping news. Who wants to find the kitten that looks like Hitler? But the general thought is that, yes, meh kind of news doesn't really do anything to us. But good news, impactful news, earth-shattering news, it changes us. It transforms our thinking, our habits, the very direction and conviction of our lives. Once as I was driving into the University of the Free State, we lived there before we moved to Pretoria. It was an Easter time and it was a difficult season for the university. There had been riots and racial tension. And as I kind of in a burdened way with my own heart, as I go up to in my car to the boom gate, the security lady just looks at me with such a joy on her face. And it was almost like just pulsating out of her. And I ask her, how are you doing? And she says, so well. My soul is so well. And I thought that's not a normal answer. So I asked her why. She said, because it's Easter time. Here was a person who in the midst of all the news flying at her politics and bad things happening in the country and all of this, she had a hope in the Easter of a life, death, and resurrected God in Jesus for her, for her life, for her salvation, for her restoration, for her future. And it changed her in the inside. That's why Tim Keller so famously says that the gospel, the good news of Jesus, it's not the ABCs of the faith that I start in and then I move on to the deep stuff. He says, no, it is the A 
to Z. That is, he says, the, cro- the whole of the Christian life. It flows from the good news of what Jesus has done. The key to genuine lifelong joy, continual boldness, growing resilience and faith is I have to constantly see what God has done in my salvation through the word and the spirit and the people of God. I love the fact that verse 47 to 48, it says there that it wasn't just this overnight thing. No, he says, you know what, you guys that have experienced this incredible thing, the salvation in Jesus now, he says, you need to be baptized in water. That's the next step. Why? Because it's a journey. He says, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit for empowerment, for witnessing. Why? That's the next step because it's a journey. In fact, they even say there in verse 48, please stay with us for a couple of days. Why? Teach us, help us, guide us, disciple us. It's not a moment and I move on. It's a journey and I take it step by step as I grow. This is salvation, a people of salvation, having deeper and more profound answers in my heart and my soul and my emotions to questions like, what is the salvation that's taken place in my life? What does it lead to? How do I receive it? And how do those around me share in this hope? Now I truly understand. And you know, there are thousands of things all throughout our life that is affected by the salvation. But I just want to stand still just on one of the last couple of minutes we have left here. And it's this, if I truly understand salvation as I'm growing in it, what Jesus has done in my heart, in my life, I will see that it comes to a true understanding of three things, of identity, of maturity, and of eternity. Identity, maturity, eternity. It's understanding that salvation means I am saved, identity, that I am being saved, maturity, and that I will be saved as a Christian, eternity. Read with me in 1 Thessalonians 5.23. It says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you, shape you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He, verse 24, who calls you is faithful and he will do it. What is Paul saying here in 1 Thessalonians? He's saying that the complete process that Jesus begins and will bring to completion is a holistic work of salvation. That my spirit and my soul and my body, my spirit, the essence of who I have been created to be, my soul, my emotions, my convictions, my habits, but also my body. He says all three of those things, they will be saved. And I need to understand that there is an essence of my identity that I am saved. There's an essence of my now soul, who I am in my mind and in my habits that is being saved. But there's an essence also in my body that we will receive renewed, restored, resurrected bodies when Jesus returns or when we die. And he says in that new creation state, he says you will be saved. Let's look at the implications of those three just really quickly. First up, identity. That my spirit is saved. Identity means that what? I am a new creation in Jesus. I am God's beloved in Jesus. I am fully forgiven in Jesus. I am in perfect, eternal, blameless standing before God in Jesus. I am called and chosen for God's purposes in my life in Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 so famously says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. The old has passed away and see the new has come. Ephesians 5, 8. For once you were in darkness, but now you are the light in the Lord. I am saved. So what does that mean? It means when you sin, when you struggle, when you stumble, go back to your identity. Not the activities or the circumstances of your life. Your identity is the most true statement about you if you're a Christian. You can't earn it. You can't make it. You can't can't shift it. 
Now, Romans 8 says there is no condemnation for those who have right standing before God as their identity. Why? Because of Jesus. We don't earn it. He has saved us. And our identity is now perfectly put down before God. You are saved. No one can challenge or change that. But secondly, now maturity also means that what my soul, my thoughts, my habits, my, my ways, my soul is being saved. Maturity means that through God's word and God's spirit and God's people, now daily, weekly, yearly, decade in, decade out, my thoughts are being reshaped. My habits are being reformed. My brokenness is being healed. My gifting is being developed. And my calling is being revealed. It's a process. It's a journey. Identity cannot be shifted. Maturity is this beautiful work that God is doing in me for the rest of my life and into the rest of the beyond. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this age, but be what? transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your mind is the direction of your life. The quality of your thinking determines the quality of your life. The direction of your thinking determines the direction of your faith and your life. He says, renew your mind, what? So that you may discern what is good and pleasing and the perfect will of God. 2 Peter 3.18 says, but grow, that's a journey, it's not a destination, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Maturity is not an overnight success. It's the slow cooker of the Holy Spirit making you who God has meant you to be. So when you lose your cool at work, when you suck in parenting at the moment, when you feel like you're not progressing in your faith, don't lose hope. Be patient and once again ask the Holy Spirit, I am willing and able, will you shape me in whom you have meant me to be? And finally, not just identity and maturity, I am saved, I am being saved, but lastly, eternity. I will be saved. First Thessalonians once again says, he will do this. Eternity means that my body will be saved. Eternity means I will be with God in his new creation forever. It means that all the suffering and the sadness that I experience in this life, it will be eclipsed by an endless joy and peace. It means that my faithfulness in this life to the call of Jesus with my time and my treasures and my talents, it will be honored and rewarded by God in his new creation. It means that my mental health struggles or the sickness in my body that I experience, those things will be fully healed and restored to a resurrected body state like Jesus had. 1 John 3, 2 says, Dear friends, we are called, we are called God's children now, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. But we know that when He appears, we will be like him. First Peter 5, 4. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. First Corinthians 5, 54. When this incorruptible body or this corruptible body is clothed with incorruptibility, and when this mortal body is clothed with immortality, then... This saying that is written will take place. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where death is your victory? Where death is your sting? We will be saved. So when the world's evil just overwhelms you and you can't take it anymore, when sickness in your body or in, in your family is just breaking your spirit, or when life just seems unfair and you can't take it anymore, don't give up. There will be an end. God will write the final chapter and he will swallow you up into eternal joy of a new creation. We have to come to the understanding that fuels our day-to-day -day life, that I am saved, identity, that I am being saved, maturity, and that I will be saved, eternity.
I love, just in closing, verse 43 in our Acts passage, it says, all the prophets testify about him, Jesus, that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. And right at the end of that chapter, we didn't read it, but it says that when the Jewish Christians heard this, that non-Jewish Christians, people of all nations and tribes and tongues are now being brought into this salvation, this promise that was started in the Old Testament. It says they were stunned to silence. And then they started glorifying God. Why? Because he was leading all people to a place of what? Repentance. Repentance is the Greek word metanoia that simply means when I'm, when I'm confronted with Jesus, what God has done in Jesus, I have an opportunity to completely reorient my mind and my heart so that my whole life now aligns in faith with Him. He is my King. He is my Lord. He is my Savior. Repentance means a, a so divine and so practical and so deep change of heart and mind that the whole direction of my life makes a 180 degree turn to faith in Jesus. You are the one that I want. I don't want to be the captain of my soul. I don't want to chase after money and sex to find fulfillment that's never there. I don't want to waste all the years of my life trying to put myself at the center of the universe. Jesus, I want you. I want to accept you. I want to know you. I want to experience your God reality. All people. In fact, Peter is stunned by the fact that even those whom he had no faith for, the people that he not ever would think that God would bring into his kingdom, those very people, people like you and me, he says, through Jesus, we are saved. You know, I had a, a neighbor in uh, one of the first places I ever stayed in. And this guy was so angry at God. He was so angry at the church. Once even as a pastor, he invited me to the Halloween celebration and he bought in kind of tongue in cheek, dressed fashion, he bought me a pitchfork and some horns. Like he was giving me the devil outfit as the pastor. I have a good evening with them and I leave early. And eventually, like two o'clock in the morning, I hear this banging on my door. And he, you know, as, he, as I open up the door, it's just this bloodshot red eyes. And he's so distraught. He's drunk out of his mind. And he's just saying, why? Why, Jesus? Why, Jesus? I could see the desperation in this man. And even though our friendship became so strong over many years, he never came to the place of accepting Jesus. In fact, at the back of this wall, before we painted this venue, we had all these names written down for people that we trusting that they would, they would find salvation in Jesus. I wrote down his name. And then just a couple of weeks ago, I got the good news that this guy, because of him and his wife starting to exercise with a bunch of other people and some of them being strong Christians, the influence of that good news of salvation, eventually it bore right through all of the pain of his life, the hurt of his life, the disillusionment with religion in his life, and it found that inner core of lostness, of hopelessness, of just a scared little boy wanting to know his father, and Jesus saved them. They were baptized. In fact, I saw on Facebook the other day the two of them serving in Doxedo Bloemfontein, in the crew, greeting people with a smile on their face. Why? Because Christianity is not about politics. It's not about opposing people. No, they were a people of salvation. Every day turning the diamond of what God has done, that he has saved me, identity, that he is saving me, maturity, and that he will save me, eternity. Let me pray for you. Jesus, I pray that every person who hears these words would be brought back to a place of joy in their salvation. And if they do not know you, God, that they would just right now, just right where you are, close your eyes, pray to God, call upon the name of Jesus. Because you are powerful, God. You change lives. You changed my life and you continue to do so. Salvation in Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Amen.